What's your favorite part of summer? Hanging out at the beach with all your friends? Playing frisbee with all your friends? How about the killer heat waves that have come to destroy us all? If you went for option number two, the U.S. right now has almost certainly been the place to be for the past few days. Here's what you need to know. A severe heat wave affecting 40 million Americans has seen temperatures over 100 degrees Fahrenheit beat records in Wyoming, Utah, Arizona, and Southern California, according to NBC News. It has two main causes, according to the Associated Press. First, a heat dome or area of high pressure. Sinking air from the Earth's atmosphere prevents air near the ground from rising. That sinking air operates like a cap, trapping warm ground air in place, according to the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Without rising air, there is also no rain, and nothing to stop hot air from becoming hotter. That high pressure works in combination with a two-decade dry spell that has sucked moisture out of soil in much of the western United States. Usually, some of the sun's heat evaporates moisture in the soil, but according to the Associated Press, scientists say the western soil is now so dry that the energy is instead used to make the air even warmer. As a consequence of the extreme heat, at least 14 new wildfires broke out this week in Montana and Wyoming alone. Firefighters also fought fires in Arizona and New Mexico, with U.S. Department of Agriculture meteorologist Gina Palma saying these were certainly conditions that we would not normally see in June. Power networks across the country have also been strained due to increased use of air conditioning, according to Reuters. Operators in California asked homeowners across the state to conserve energy in the late afternoon and evening when demand surges. In graphs published on its website, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency showed that heat waves like this are almost three times as frequent as they were in the 1960s, increasing steadily for over 60 years. Furthermore, the duration of these heat waves is now almost a full day longer. What we are watching here is climate change, and at least part of it is man-made, according to the Associated Press. A study published last year in the journal Science found that man-made climate change tied to greenhouse gas emissions is responsible for around half of the historic drought that caused the drying out of the soil. Added to this, NASA's website helpfully explains that human activities, such as burning fuel to power factories, cars, and buses, cause the atmosphere to trap more heat than it used to, which increases the Earth's average temperature. Now, of course, heat waves have always occurred. The American Meteorological Society simply defines a heat wave as a period of abnormally and uncomfortably hot and usually humid weather, which we all know was hardly unheard of before. But the point is this, if the Earth's overall average temperature is higher, existing factors like heat domes can more readily push us over into extreme heat, particularly as some defenses against that heat, like the moisture in the soil, are also taken away. Hence, you know, America keeps doing that whole thing where it sets on fire a lot, which it didn't really seem to do as often before. The consequences of all this are not just great action shots of massive fires on TV either. Reuters interviewed one Phoenix resident who described the situation in the U.S. right now as feeling somewhat apocalyptic, and they had a point. According to the WHO, more than 166,000 people in the world died due to extreme temperatures between 1998 and 2017. What's more, between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress. The only response to this, that is anything less than a collective death wish, is a rapid reduction in fossil fuel use. Production of coal, oil, and gas must fall by 6% year-on-year until 2030 to keep global heating under the 1.5 degrees Celsius target agreed in the Paris Accord, according to one UN report. It's either that or we can sit back and enjoy more insane spectacles. Lake Mead is the massive lake that was created when the Hoover Dam was finished in 1936. This vital reservoir has now reached the lowest level it has ever been, and weather forecasts show that it will probably drop a lot lower. If this happens, all electricity generation inside the Hoover Dam's wall will shut down, and thousands of farms will turn back to the dust they were before the dam was built. Here are the details. 
NBC News reports that water levels in Lake Mead, the largest U.S. reservoir by volume, fell to 36 percent, its lowest level ever on Thursday, June 11th, as the region continues to face the effects of a devastating prolonged drought. Lake Mead was formed when the Hoover Dam was built in the 1930s. It provides water for urban, rural, and tribal lands across the southwest. Officials expect levels to get worse through another dry, hot summer. In normal years, the dam produces enough electricity for 8 million people, but the water shortage will slow energy output. Every foot of lake level decline means about 6 megawatts of lost capacity. The Hoover Dam's energy capacity has already dropped by 25 percent, and levels will continue to decline through this autumn. Las Vegas recently became the first city in the U.S. to ban useless grass around streets, offices, and housing developments in an effort to conserve water. The devastating drought has caused the Colorado River system to decline to half its capacity, and the basin has seen historically low inflows over the last 16 years. The rapid decline has prompted plans for the first ever water shortage declaration from the federal government. The declaration, which will probably be issued in August of this year, would affect distribution to states and Mexico. You might not be able to buy a new smartphone next year because of a drought currently affecting Taiwan. Here's how that works. Taiwan's worst drought in decades could further strain an already unstable global supply chain for production of the semiconductors that power the world's notebooks, monitors, TVs, smartphones, tablets, and cars. In an average year, Taiwan receives 2,500 millimeters of rainfall, the most of any OECD equivalent country, according to Taiwan Business Topics. However, while typhoons usually hit Taiwan from the east during the rainy season and help replenish reservoirs, in 2020, for the first time in 56 years, no typhoon made landfall. The effect has been a drastic drop in water supply, with water levels at the country's largest reservoir, Tsengwen, falling to their lowest in 15 years, and the Baihe Reservoir now completely dry, according to the AFP. Taiwan's semiconductor industry is vulnerable to the drop because its processes for cleaning chips and creating a hyper-sterile environment for their production are water-intensive. AFP reports its largest manufacturer, TSMC, alone goes through 156,000 metric tons of water a day. Other sectors are also vulnerable. According to the CIA World Factbook, industry uses 10% of Taiwan's water supply, households use 20%, and agriculture up to 65%, despite the latter contributing just 1.8% of GDP. Lack of storage capacity makes Taiwan vulnerable to climate change. Citing Taiwan's Water Resources Agency, Taiwan Business Topics reports reservoirs only constitute around 25% of its water supply, with rivers providing almost 50% and groundwater extraction 30%. Taiwan can store only around a month and a half's water requirement. One possible solution to the crisis, building more dams, remains unlikely as the ideal locations have already been used. Taiwan Business Topics also notes that Taiwan's mountains and lack of an extensive river system mean most rainfall is washed into the sea. A recent MIT study suggests that northern China is set to become uninhabitable by the end of the century unless drastic measures are taken to slow down global warming. The North China Plain is home to 400 million people and one of the most densely populated areas in the world. It is the core of the country and includes the nation's capital, Beijing. It's also an important agricultural area where intensive irrigation leads to higher humidity in the air. This point is particularly important according to the researchers behind the study. To determine survivability in hot weather, they used an index called the wet bulb temperature, which takes into account both humidity and temperature. They found that above a wet bulb temperature of 35 degrees Celsius, equivalent to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, even a healthy person in the shade may not be able to survive. And using detailed model simulations of the area, they found that if global warming continues at the same pace, northern China will be the most critical hotspot in the world. If other areas, such as the Gulf or southern Iran, might be facing similarly dangerous heat waves in the future, they're far less densely populated than northern China. According to researchers, these humid heat waves could, quote, push the area against the boundaries of habitability. China is currently the first ranked country in the world for greenhouse gas emissions just before the U.S. It seems Chinese officials are going to have to start worrying about the consequences now. 
The Guardian reports that a study by the Chinese Academy of Sciences has found that recent human activity has shifted the Earth's axis by an unprecedented margin. The planet's geographic north and south poles are the points where its axis of rotation intersects the surface, but they are not fixed. Changes in how the Earth's mass is distributed around the planet cause the axis, and therefore the poles, to move. In the past, only natural factors such as ocean currents and the convection of hot rock in the deep Earth contributed to the drifting of the poles. But the new research shows that since the 1990s, the loss of hundreds of billions of tons of ice a year into the oceans, resulting from global warming, has caused the poles to move in new directions. The scientists found the average speed of drift from 1995 to 2020 was 17 times faster than from 1981 to 1995. Since 1980, the positions of the poles have moved about 4 meters. The study theorizes that the accelerated decline of water stored on land is the main driver of the rapid polar drift since the 1990s. The flatlands of the Siberian tundra were shaken by a violent and powerful explosion that blew out a huge crater 30 meters deep. CNN reports that this explosion last year was the 17th blowout crater to appear in Russia's remote Yamal and Gita Arctic peninsulas since the first was spotted in 2013. The new crater also offered the first opportunity for a scientist to use drones to build a 3D model of the crater. The 3D model largely confirmed what scientists had hypothesized. Methane gas builds in a cavity in the ice, causing a mound to appear at ground level. The mound grows in size before blowing out ice and other debris in an explosion, leaving behind a massive crater. What's still unclear is the source of the methane. It could be coming from layers deep within the Earth, or closer to the surface, or a combination of the two. Scientists believe that the frozen Earth of Siberia's tundra acted as a plug that kept the methane trapped. As the region warms up and the permafrost melts for the first time in recorded history, it's expected that the methane blowouts would become more frequent. For more news animations and explainers, hit the subscribe and bell button to join the Tomo News family. Thanks for watching.